bowling, the world's favorite indoor sport. And now from two of America's finest professional bowlers, tips, techniques, and insights to improve your game. Welcome to Bowling Techniques of the Masters. The art of improving your average. Featuring Bowler of the Year, Mike Albee. And Bowler of the Year and Hall of Famer, Mark Roth. Now here's Mike Albee and Mark Roth. Hi, I'm Mike Albee. Hi, I'm Mark Roth. There's a gap between the average bowler and the good bowler. We're going to narrow that gap. Let's talk about lane surfaces right now. There are two different types of lane surfaces. There's wood, which is made out of maple, and synthetics, which seems to be like a formica top. You get two different reactions with the two different surfaces. On a synthetic surface, or like Mark said, the, the formica finish, you get the oil moving down the lane as the ball travels. It'll carry the oil down the lane or to the back end of the lane where the ball should be finishing. And you get a different reaction on the wood surface. The oil seems to evaporate in the front part of the lane, so you get a much earlier hook and still get a skid or not as much roll to the pocket on the back end because the oil is still down on the back end of the lane. I feel on the synthetic lanes when I bowl, my ball goes further down the lane before it makes a break. And on the wooden lanes, it hooks about 10 to 15 feet earlier and the ball finishes very hard. I think the, uh, the Formica top or the synthetic top is uh, a more consistent surface than the wood seems to be, only because the oil doesn't evaporate. It still stays on the lane, but it goes down the lane. So uh, I, I tend, to, tend to lean towards the uh, synthetics to what I like. I kind of like the synthetics also. My ball reacts better, and I really don't have to make too many adjustments on the lanes while I'm bowling. Nowadays, though, it seems like uh, the up-and-coming age of bowling seems to be the synthetics. You'll still find more wood than you do synthetics now, but it seems like the industry is leaning towards synthetics. Definitely, Mike. It's uh, less maintenance for the bowling proprietor, and uh, it's easy to maintain the lanes for a, a consistent condition. I think now, Mark, we'll talk a little bit about uh, lane conditioning or how the oil is laid onto the surface of the lane. Uh, there's quite a few different patterns they can use on the lane. I know you can oil evenly from gutter to gutter, or they can have a slight crown where it comes start from the middle all the way out to the gutter with heavier oil in the center. And I think uh, nowadays they seem to be leaning more towards the uh, crown because there's an awful lot of play on the center part of the lane, so you need an extra amount of oil to kind of hold that condition in there. Uh, basically what they've been doing, and <clears throat> we've been doing it also, Bong Pride, is uh, putting more oil across the middle to protect the lanes. And uh, most proprietors will oil, double oil lanes later on in the afternoon to hold up the condition for the nighttime bowlers. Plus now it seems like there's a new condition, the short oil condition, which uh, I believe is 26 feet. They're, going, they're only carrying the oil 26 feet down the lane, so you get uh, quite a bit of oil in the first 26 feet, and then you have no oil past the 26-foot mark. So you get kind of a, a, a very uh, fast skid, or the ball shoots through the first 26 feet, and then wants a duck hook on the back 26 feet. But after about three or four games, the oil does carry down, and uh, back ends do get tighter, so you need another bowling ball with you to be competitive for the night. Plus, they still use the, the same long oil type patterns, too. They can carry oil as far down the lane as they want. It's not the most ideal condition sometimes, because you still want to have the ball being able to finish into the back end. With, with the long oil format, you really can't put a big blend across the lanes, because you do have the long oil down the lanes. So the scores are a little bit lower on the 35-foot range. So uh, as you can see, there's a lot of different conditions, uh, more oil, less oil. It just depends on what your proprietor or what the center you're, you're bowling in is using. So uh, there's a lot of different areas you go to you can bowl with. Uh, personally, I like to play the outside part of the lane, the one through five boards. So that's where I'll start at when I go out to bowl. I'll start with my favorite shot. I don't know about you, Mark, when you go into the center to try to figure out how the conditions are. Basically, on the right side, and, and what I like is second arrow, third arrow, and when I come into center, I try about 10, 11, 12, and if my ball is hooking too much, I'll, I'll move into the third arrow. Yeah, so basically that's the way it goes. You go with the shot you feel most comfortable with when you walk into a center. I'm more comfortable with playing the outside five boards. I'll try that shot first. If it doesn't work, I'll edge my way in five boards at a time until I find a decent reaction, or a reaction where I can feel comfortable with throwing the ball, where I feel like I have a little room, and the ball will make a nice, even arc to the pocket. 
and uh, on the right side, you basically every bowling center will track a second arrow, and that's where your average bowler will come in and try bowling, and uh, if his ball doesn't hook, uh, he could always move to the right side of the lane and have a decent shot. I think when I go into bowl league, uh, I kind of watch the early league bowl a little bit. You know, if you're bowling in the later league, I want to see where somebody on the left side, and I'm sure you do on the right side, you wanna, I try to find somebody that throws the ball similar the way I do, so I can get an idea of where they're playing on the lanes. You might, it's kind of like, I guess, taking a shortcut, basically, rather than letting your ball be the guide when you go out there and bowl and finding the shot. But I go out and watch somebody see, just to see what area of the lane they're playing. I don't want to pinpoint exactly what board they're playing, but I want to know a certain area or a certain zone to start with. When I go out to bowl, I normally, in my league, uh, I think I hook the ball more at home than I do on tour. So I have to move three or four boards further left than normal bowler at home. And uh, I make my adjustments by watching where my ball's breaking down the lane and uh, the move it's making to the pocket. I can either go to a smooth, shiny ball or take a harder shell ball out, just something to get down the lane further. I think a lot of times, uh during a three-game league session, they won't really break down as much as they would for us in a six or eight game block, but uh, they won't break down a certain amount. They are going to break down. They're not going to be able to stand in the same place all night and be able to just hit the pocket all night standing in the same place. What they should do is uh, watch the bowlers who are bowling good, uh, try and make a, an adjustment off of his game, put into their game, and uh, just try and go out and make good shots, not try to force the ball or really just overpower the conditions. Yeah, I, I think a lot of times people will go out and they'll think the lanes might be hooking more or getting a little bit tighter, and uh, basically they, they kind of panic a little bit. They won't just keep an, an even keel or an even mind going where they, they try to panic a little bit maybe. And the main thing you should remember, don't second guess your, your game. Have confidence in your game and trust your game. Don't, don't think that the lanes are breaking down and maybe you threw a bad shot or vice versa. You have to know whether you've thrown a good shot or not to whether you can make an adjustment. And don't be afraid to go make that move on the lanes. If you're hitting a head pin on the nose, take a chance. Move a board or two. Uh, you have nothing to lose. If you're hitting the nose, leaving seven or eight, you might be able to make an adjustment, hit the pocket and throw a line or, or carry a strike. I know a lot of times for me, when the lanes start to break down a little bit, uh, my ball starts hooking a little bit earlier, I start to lose the pocket a little bit. Uh, a lot of times, I'll switch to a different ball. Uh, same, I'm using a softer surface ball. I want to use something that's going to go a little bit longer so I can get back into the pocket. I'll switch to a harder surface ball or even a shinier surface ball, something that's not going to have as much friction or grab the lane as much. I, I don't know what kind of adjustment you might make. Well, I'll move in a couple of boards on the lane and uh, try and use the track to my advantage. Use a little more speed, a little more loft. As you know, I could get the ball down the lane pretty well and uh, make my adjustments because I like to play inside on the lane and I feel if you could use the majority part of the track you will strike more. Yeah, I think a lot of times what you want to do is uh, when they are hooking a little bit more, bring yellow more, you want to move more towards the inside part of the lane where normally there's a little bit more oil. As we found sometimes, it's not always there. So do as what Mark says, uh, a little more loft, a little more speed, or try what I said and change the surface of the ball to a little shinier or a little harder. Mike, let's talk about something that a lot of bowlers, maybe yourself, I don't know, don't know about, bowling pins. That's right. I, I really don't know much about bowling pins. So, Mark, you're a proprietor. I think you should know more about it than I do. Uh, what are the holes inside the pin for? Those are two voids in the pin to make the pin so that uh, manufacturers can't make the pin to legal specifications, three pounds, six ounces, seven ounces. And it's just the two voids to make the pins so they can bounce around. So these actually help the pin move from the sideboards, actually bounce off the walls and, and come back for strikes, right? Yes, it does help. And it's made out of hard maple, laminated. So you have a real hard piece of wood that's very tightly constructed. You mentioned earlier about uh, three pounds, six ounce, three pounds, seven. Can you have a 10 pound pin? Is, is it too much or is there a maximum too? Right now the uh, ABC maximum is three pounds, six ounces to three pounds, 10 ounces. Normally you don't vary within two ounces per set per machine. I know sometimes, you know, you'll throw a ball down there and I'll leave a, a really weak seven pin or something or a five pin and, and I wondered if those weren't 10 pound pins, so it's not a 10 pound pin, right? No, it could be that you didn't throw the ball that well. Uh, let's talk about the different types of finishes on the pins. The pin you have is uh, plastic coated, which is not being manufactured right now. Uh, most of the companies 
went to a nylon Serlin coated pin for durability and higher scores and right now across the country that's all you're bowling against. So those actually make the pins also, besides the voids inside the pin, the cover is also helps the pin fly across the lane for you too. Especially with the nylon and Serlin covered pins. You could take a plastic pin and a, a, a nylon coated pin and hold them about waist high and drop them and you'll see the difference when they bounce. Now, we talked about 3 pounds 6, 3 pounds 7 ounce. Uh, is that the only dimensions that are the same, or is that, I mean, are the, the diameter the same, and all pins are the same, correct? All pins are 15 inches tall, and I think they're about 15 inches in diameter, and uh, they're all the same. Except for just a little bit, a couple ounces here or there, that's, that's the yeah, only difference in pins. that's it. Which one, are there any surface that you like to bowl against more, that you feel you carry better strikes with? Well, I like the nylons. Uh, they they bounce around nylons and some. They bounce around a lot, but uh, you do get a lot of solid wraps. So uh, basically, the best shot with the newer pins is a, a light mixer. I'd have to agree with that too. I, I enjoy the the, the uh, nylon coated surfaces. They seem to bounce a lot better too, and a lot more pin action. You get pins coming out of the back, and a lot of seven tens have been made this year on tour. So uh, you know. Good pin, a good bounce, maybe a couple more pins in your score. Mike, let's talk about bowling surfaces. Uh, when I started, first started bowling in 1961, all we had was uh, rubber bowling balls, and uh, basically made out of rubber and some cork, and uh, we bowled on lacquer lane finishes, and it seemed to be the best ball at that particular time to bowl with, and uh, the balls hit very well. And uh, bowlers at that time were able to pick up the ball going down the lane with three dots or circles or logos from the companies. What did you use when you first started bowling? Well, back in 1972, when, when I first started bowling, uh, we used to bowl something like this, uh, a plastic type of surface. Uh, it came in more colors than the, the black rubber balls did, and uh, you get about any color you wanted back then. Plus, they started making the balls even a little bit softer so they'd grab the lane surface uh, a little bit better, obviously, so you could hook the ball a little bit more and even hit the pins harder. And uh, so plastic was, was pretty much the big thing back then. Now, the rubber balls were still in use, but the plastic balls were kind of edging them out a little bit. And uh, now the rubber and plastic are still used, but they're being edged out by the urethane ball. Yes, the urethane ball came out in 1981 and uh, basically was used for urethane lane finishes and uh, as the bowlers on the tour start winning and scoring higher with them uh, you don't see too many plastic balls or rubber balls being used on the tour today. It seems like one thing now the, the urethane ball Mark is holding as you see comes in a different color and uh, they come in as much colors as the plastics did you know back in the 70s and uh, so there's really not the black syndrome you know stuck in the, the black color bowling ball like the rubber balls. Uh, you get any color you want any softness you want nowadays to make hard and soft urethane balls, uh, shiny, where the ball will go down farther down the lane before it breaks because the surface has less friction, or you can get them to look like they've just been sanded, so they grab the lane very soon when there's a lot of oil. We've been using them successfully, I would say, for the last five, six years. And uh, what we do is we try and, and come out with a ball that will hook for us and carry. Urethane balls definitely out carry plastic and rubber balls right now. They, they very much so. They, they hit the pins so much harder, plus they grab the lane so much, so much more that, uh, but yet not early. They'll grab the lane, but farther down the lane. They'll still give you that nice skid roll hook pattern, and which, which is a key in bowling. You need the ball to skid the first 15 feet or so, go into a roll, and then hook towards the pocket. And that's where you get to carry on the pins. It's where it hooks. Now, Mark, we want to talk a little bit about ball drillings or the three basic grips of a bowling ball. The first grip is the conventional grip, which most beginner bowlers use because they have more of a comfortable grip on the ball and they feel like they're not going to lose the ball. And the conventional grip consists of you put the two fingers all the way into the second joint into the ball, and then obviously your thumb goes all the way into the ball. And the, bit, the grip looks exactly like this. All the way into the second joint, and then the thumb goes all the way into the ball. Now I'll, use, now I'll talk about the grip that I use out on the tour, and that is a semi-fingertip grip, which means you put your finger all the way into directly in between the first and the second joint. Semi-fingertip grip. 
right between the first and second joint. And it looks like this. Basically like that. Now we'll go to the grip that Mark Roth uses on the tour. Which is the fingertip, My, my Put my fingers into the first joint, like, like this. Put my thumb all the way in. It's basically most of the bowlers on the tour use it for more lift, more power, and it's more comfortable for bowlers on a tour. I kind of go to a, a relaxed grip. I've had tendonitis three, four times, and I'm a little shorter than normal, but I still get the lift, the turn, and the power to knock the pins over. The three grips again, the conventional, which goes all the way into the second joint, which is for the beginning bowler because they feel like they have more control or they feel like they're not going to lose the ball. I use a semi-fingertip grip only because the conventional grip is too many fingers in a ball and I'm not able to get the amount of lift that I need. And because the, the full fingertip grip, which you use, which is only goes into the first joint, you get a lot more fingers in the ball, a lot more revolutions on the ball. But sometimes people have trouble controlling the ball because their hand doesn't seem to be able to stay behind the ball as well. But Mark has a good, strong hand, and a lot of the bowlers are able to do that. That's why I feel more comfortable with the semi-fingertip grip. Once again, the conventional grip, semi-fingertip, and the full fingertip grip. Mike, let's talk about one subject we haven't talked about yet. Is it bowling shoes? What kind of shoes do you use? Well, as you know, Mark, uh, the bowling shoe is just as important as the bowling ball because if you can't get to the line properly, you're not going to throw the ball properly. And uh, I use the Lynn shoe, as uh, I believe you do also, and as do 90 to 95 percent of the professional bowlers on tour, they also use the Lynn shoe. The Lynn shoe has a custom shoe which is, is fit specially for your foot and also has many different slide pads. Also, they have the classic shoe, which is basically a shoe that is a stock size. Uh, now I'll go ahead and show the, the people out there a few of the different slide soles that we have. This is basically what the Lynn shoe looks like on the outside. Then we'll turn it over, and this is what we end up with in the slide. This is the slide pad area, then we go to the heel. This shoe is for a very tacky or a very sticky approach. We have a very hard slide pad. It doesn't give up very much resistance at all. We also have the heel covered with a buckskin. The heel is where we, slop, where we stop, stops our slider, actually slows us down before we go over the foul line. So we have a buckskin on that to also help us slide. Now I'd like to show you another shoe, which is a shoe I use on tour, as do a lot of professionals. This is basically your, your medium shoe. It has a buckskin slide pad, gives you a medium amount of resistance, enough to slow you down, but also the rubber heel to stop your slide. Now I think we'll go to the shoe that Mark uses out on the tour. And Mark, I'll let you explain to them what the shoe you use. This is the perforated sole, and basically I use it so I don't slide. I don't like to slide, and uh, it stops me short. I have good balance. I plant, and uh, for me, it's, it's something where I don't have to worry about going over the foul line. I'm going to be three to four inches short of the foul line, and uh, that's what I want. Hey, remember now, this is a shoe that helps you stop, plant, like Mark says, plant, or actually stop quickly, not very much slide, with the perforated sole and the ribbed rubber heel. This is what Mark Roth uses. For good balance. And good balance. And this shoe is the one that a lot of professors use because it gives you a nice medium slide. It has a rubber heel and the buckskins, buckskin slide pad. That's the shoe that a lot of guys use. But remember, the perforated for sticky or tacky approaches, and this one for the medium approaches. Also, I'd like to maybe talk a little bit about the non-sliding sole. Or this is the shoe which that we don't slide with. It gives us our pivot step going into our slide. And this shoe, Mark, is the, the basic one. This one here is basically really rubber. It gives you a grip on the approach so you don't slip and actually go off balance before you actually go into your slide. This is just a basic rubber with a rubber heel. Sometimes we hit slick approaches where you slip in that pivot step and then you're off balance and you're not able to slump, not able to hit that slide perfectly and hit your release perfectly. So we go to one that still has a rubber heel, but also we add more of a, a crepe or a rubber slide bar, or actually this, it gives you more grip so you don't slip going into that slide. So basically this is your normal, normal pivot shoe, and then one that helps you on slippery approaches. Basically that's the main shoes you can order from Lens, and they're very high quality shoes. Like I said, 90 to 95% of the pros use those shoes. Very well constructed shoes. The last thing we want to talk about, Mark, is bowling accessories. And that encompasses a lot of things. We have uh, wristbands, 
grips, rosin bags, a lot of things. And uh, why don't you try explaining what you're wearing, Mark? Well, uh, my right hand, I have a Cobra. Uh, you know, I guess it's meant to keep your wrist straight and uh, so you could follow through straight. I've never used one of these, and uh, I guess I wouldn't know what to do with it. It obviously helped some bowlers on the tour win some tournaments. Uh, for me, I feel restricted. I like to have my wrist nice and relaxed and loose because there's times when I'm bowling, I will do things instinctively that I would, normally wouldn't be able to do if I wore a bowling I think I, I agree, too. I, I do not like to be inhibited with your, with your wrist movements at all with a, a wristband. The wristbands keep your, your wrist nice and straight, which for a beginner bowler or somebody with a weak wrist is very good, like the one Mark's wearing there. As you can see, he cannot move his wrist back and forth very much at all. It keeps him pretty much locked into a straight wrist position, which is good for a lot of bowlers, like I said, with a weak wrist or a beginner bowler. So it, it, it can be a very good aid. Uh, once you get to be uh, you know, more of a higher average bowler, I don't, I don't feel you need those. I really don't. Especially if you can work with your wrist and strengthen your wrist up. Uh, you get out there and you can do a lot more with your wrist than being prohibitive wearing a exactly. glove. Exactly. There's a lot of adjustments you can make with your game by moving your wrist around. And when you're locked in with one of those things, I think it's you're very just, difficult. You're just locked in. You can't, right. You're very restricted. It's just one release and, and that's it. We see a lot of pros use those on TV. Why? Well, uh, it has been mentioned that uh, some bowlers do get paid for endorsing certain products. And uh, I guess that's one of them what they do. Uh, As we both know, there are incentives on a tour. A lot of guys are paid to wear those on TV, and it wouldn't be so bad if they were using exactly what you can buy in a store. A lot of times, the inside metal bars are ripped out of them, and they're not wearing the exact product as it was made to be sold. But there are guys that, don't get me wrong, there are professionals that do use the real thing, but a lot of times, it's, it's for not. One piece of equipment you do use, Mark, and that's what? Here's a rosin bag, Mike. I like to keep my hands dry, and uh, during the course of a tournament, your hands start sweaty a little bit. TV finals. You want to keep your hands dry, so you get a good, good grip on the ball. So I use a rosin bag to keep my hands dry. And it's one of the more inexpensive items, really, and, and most pros do use it because they do like to get rid of that sweat or the, the griminess in their hands it's so they can get a good release on the ball. 25 cents, 50 cents. So it's very inexpensive. One of the last items I'd like to talk about is finger inserts and also thumb inserts. I use the thumb insert, which this gives me a consistent feel when I change bowling balls or go to a different bowling ball. I use, say, around five or six different bowling balls a week. So you need a consistent feel from bowling ball to bowling ball. So I use the thumb insert to get that consistent feel. Uh, there's also finger inserts. I do not use those. I use just the regular finger holes because I like to feel just the bowling ball. The, the inserts come with a spongy material. There's, a, I believe, a urethane material and then also silicone nowadays. So I think Mark also does not use the grips because he likes to get the, the feel of the ball. I just uh, like the feel of the ball. Silicone, for me, I'd be flying out of the ball too quick. I like to be tight and snug in the ball. And when I'm tight and snug with some silicone, I'm going to fly out. I just can't use it. Even though we don't use those, they're still a very good item because you can get more lift on a bowling ball without any extra effort. So they're by no means not a bad product. They are a good product, but only for certain people. Mark and I would now like to show you how to arrive at your starting position for your approach. There are a couple of different approaches, and Mark would like to tell you about those. Thank you, Mike. There's a four-step approach, which basic bowlers normally use, five-step for a little bit more power, and a six-step for full power. I'm now going to show you how to use the four-step approach, which is, the, which is the approach that I use. Walk towards the foul line, line your back of your heels about two to three inches from the foul line. Take four brisk walking steps. One, two, three, four. Take one extra half step to include for your slide. This is your starting position for a four-step approach. Mark will now show you how he arrives at his starting position for his approach. Thank you, Mike. I do the same thing you do. Get to the foul line about three inches behind. Take six walking steps. One, two, three, four, five, six. Take a half step behind for slide, and now we're ready to bowl. If you've noticed, we arrive at the starting position the same way. Just by the amount of steps is the only difference in finding your starting position. Now that we
we found our starting position, we want to go into the push away. First of all, we have to find out where to hold the ball for our push away. That depends on a couple of factors. If we want more speed on the ball, we hold the ball higher in our push away, which gives us more speed and more backswing. If we want a medium speed, we hold the ball right around just above waist high for the medium speed. If we want to get the ball to hook a little more and throw the ball a little slower, we hold the ball lower in our push away, which will not give us as much backswing. So I'm just going to show you the medium one right now, which will be just above waist high. We want to start the ball and the foot at the same time. Now remember, this is for the four-step approach. Ball and the foot at the same time on the push away. One. Ball and the foot at the same time. Just like that. Now Mark's going to show you how to do the five and the six step push away. As Mike told you, we are now going to talk about the five step approach. You put the ball in motion on your second step. It's one more step than the four, but the first step is more for power. Take one and then second and put the ball in motion. Let's try it again. It's set. Now you're ready. Take your first step and the second and then push the ball in motion. Now let's talk about the six step approach. I take six steps to get more power and more lift into my shot. I take my first step and then my second and then put the ball in motion on my third step. This way I get more power and more lift into the shot. Let's try it again. Get ready, get set, take the first step, second and put the ball in motion. This is recommended for six steps and seven step approaches. After the push away, the weight of the ball takes over. Your arm or body should do nothing. That's why I feel it's the simplest part of the game, because the weight of the ball will carry the ball back and forth, just like, the, just like a weight on the end of a chain. Let it swing on its own. Mark, do you have any observations on that? Yes, Mike. The, the looser the swing, the more power, the more accurate you are. And if you use a force swing, you're very inconsistent. You'll have a tendency to pull the ball or let it out short. Remember, the height of the backswing depends on the height of the push away. Usually it's shoulder height or slightly above. It's not a critical point. The critical point is relax and let the weight of the ball carry the backswing. Mark, at the end of every approach is obviously the release and the follow through. Now, a lot of people want to really overturn the ball, or some people don't turn the ball at all. How do you arrive at your release point? Mike, I kind of keep my thumb at about 2 o'clock position like this. And when I'm letting the ball go through my swing, my hand stays in that position all the way through. And when I do come to release the ball, I, that's when I turn the ball over. It may look like my hand is at 9 o'clock, but when I'm releasing the ball, it's about 10, 11 o'clock. And that's how I get my turn. What you really want to do is keep your hand, your fingers, pointing the pins. This way you're directly behind the ball. And when you release the ball, you just kind of turn with the, turn with the ball. Now, now you don't want to move your hand flopping around in your backswing. It should stay stationary should stay all the way through, right? Perfectly straight. And when you follow through, you just follow through like you're shaking hands with another person. And you release the ball at the very bottom end of your swing. You don't want to release it out here or back here. It's always at the bottom of your swing, right? Bottom your momentum, your, right? Bottom of the swing so you don't loft the ball or drop the ball short. You get the ball out about 18 to 20. I think one thing we want to remember is, is smoothness too. It's, smoothness is the key to, to the game of bowling. Also, a lot of people want to go out there and maybe try to overturn it and try to do too much with their wrist or their hand. And one thing I try to remember is if you look at the way your arm is formed, if you hold it down to your side and you bring the ball straight back and you follow straight through, you can see how your arm automatically comes around a ball on its own. So if you try to do anything extra, then you're going to just try to be around on top of the ball. You're going to turn the ball early, and the ball is just not going to turn over in the back end. The ball's just going to skid down the lane. So your arm's basically made for bowling already. Yes, it is. Mike, let's sum up the approach as a whole. Uh, Basically what I do is I get my first two steps and take it kind of slow and I gradually build up speed and I feel very comfortable getting to the foul line. What should the average bowler do when he's trying to get his approach started? The key for your approach is make sure that first step is nice and smooth 
and not too fast. If your first step is fast, the whole approach is going to be fast. So the key part of the approach is your first step. Take it slow and smooth, and like you said, build momentum as you go to the line. Also, you should remember all the parts we've discussed in four different parts. When you put them together, don't make them four different parts. Make sure it's one fluid motion all together. Just one, two, three, four. We don't want to be a robot out there. Just make it all one fluid motion. Nice and relaxed, right? Nice and relaxed, and it gives you your speed and momentum on the bowling ball also as your approach. Just nice and smooth. Thank you for following along with us on our journey. These tips have helped us win five Bowl of the Year awards. Maybe they'll help you get to your goal in bowling. But remember, keep a positive mental outlook. Have fun in the sport of bowling.